Okay, um, so uh, I, so Tom and I set up this studio uh, 17 years ago. Um, his background was in theatre design, my background was in working in big practices. And, and when we set up this studio, we, uh, we met teachers, we met teachers in Cambridge. And when we set up this studio, the ambition was for it to be um, not like a practice, not a commercial practice, but to have the kind of creative intensity and wide-ranging interest of, of, a, of a design studio in an architectural school. And, and uh, 17 years later, this is the studio. Uh, we, um, we're not a commercial practice. We, uh, we do building projects, we, uh, but we also do a lot of studies. Some of these are, are self-generated perspective. Uh, some of these are commissioned. Some start in one life and become as one thing and become another. Uh, and we also uh, we also do uh, self-generated self research. And we're all involved in teaching. So Tom's teaching at Central St. Martins. I'm a still examiner for, for Westminster. Almost everybody in the office teaches in, in, in some capacity or other. And that's a very important adjunct to the business of actually producing buildings or, or, or designing business cities. Um, this is the office. It's deliberately. Um, that's an office looking more like a bureau. Um, that was it last night at six o'clock. We're preparing a big exhibition for um, for uh, Town Hall in Ghent, which happens next week. And so we're building frames. We build full-size mock-ups of rooms and stuff. It's as much a workshop uh, as it is as it, as it is an office. Um, that's something that some clients find a bit weird, but they generally find it very exciting. Um, and. In that, in that uh, wanting to practice in a kind of multivalent way, uh, we've naturally stayed small. Um, it hasn't been difficult, but we, we initially wanted to stay small because we wanted to keep control of the quality of our practices' work. And actually staying small is a way of maintaining the kind of creative intensity that you, you'll find in your undergraduate graduate studios. Uh, and that can very easily be lost in a kind of commercial office environment. Uh, so yeah, we make models, we do life drawing, we cook. Uh, that was a shot two years after we started, just the you know, kind of homage to Joseph Gandhi. These are, these are all the models after two years. Uh, and we've built very little. We've probably built half a dozen buildings that have ever been published. This is Creative Exchange in Sydney. It's, this is a student hostel in, um, in Cambridge, St. Patrick's College. This is a community centre in, um, in Trumpington. In the southern fringe of Cambridge, which I'll come on to later. This is a, a new football changing room in the Hackney, built as part of the Olympic fringe developments uh, on Mabley Green, as it says. Uh, and this is a, a refurbishment project for Trinity College, it's a 1960s building. And our latest thing, which is on site now, due to finish in a month or so, is a reinvention of a tower block in, in central of historic Norwich. Um, it was an office tower block. Uh, we're converting it to housing and the persuading planners that rather than it be knocked down, we should make it taller. Uh, so that's, um, that's been finished now. But in terms of studies, we, we, sometimes we manage to pick up commissions, sometimes we just have to do this stuff. Um, this is St Albans, we've developed a 30 year vision for St Albans, which they've adopted and, are now, oh, they, and, they, and they paid for it. Uh, as to how they should regenerate their, their city centre and, and they thought they wanted to compete with Watford, uh, with Watford, with Watford on, on its own terms but actually we persuaded them they should, they should compete with it on their terms. Uh, this is the um, Lee River Park. We won this, this competition some seven years ago uh, about establishing the Lee as, um, as the name suggests, as a cornucopia. I mean the Lee's always been the kind of hinterland of, of London. It was originally the boundary between the Roman state and the Dane law. Uh, it's always been where all London's sandwiches were made, where all the big bonded warehouses for alcohol and so on were. It's always provisioned London in a kind of covert way, and we are now turning that into a park. The first stage is on site. Uh, but it grew out of the competition. It's been adopted now by all the, the London boroughs around it. And um, by 20, 2066, it will be a park of the same size as Regent's Park. 
and if London continues to develop out to the gateway, it will be in the heart of the greater London area. Um, it's not a park in the sense of dog walking and, and aerobics, it's a park in the sense of growing food, generating energy, recycling, and, and, and opening the whole territory up to for, for walkers and cyclists and horse riders and canoeists and exploring all of that, all of that water land. Uh, this is a study for um, how you would build uh, an extension to the city of Cambridge, bordering onto the fens. So this adopts the topology of managing water, which has been known on the fence since the Dutch arrived in the 16th, 17th century, as a way of structuring a new settlement. And this, is, this was not paid for. This is something that's now become part of how basically all of Cambridge's urban extensions are being handled. But this is something we did speculatively. Um, something, uh, this is, this is um, on the southern fringe of Cambridge, this is, this is the University Press and its workshops. This was a study of how you would take a large industrial, light industrial estate in the middle of the city and turn it into a new quarter, mixed use quarter. <coughs> this is Oval Town in, in um, so these, these really dealing with problems of incipient urbanity. I mean, areas that one knows are going to become urban, but how do you establish a topography for that and a structure for that before the housing developers will be in parcel it up and build. So it's about trying to establish stronger, um, more structured um, plans for, for cities and, and, and bringing, bringing in uses. So the way to um, regenerate Oval Town in Hackney was actually to relocate the horse guards who are looking for a new barrack and looking for a park that can exercise in. It's a slightly strange, slightly even surreal juxtaposition, but actually it might work. And, and we're talking to the horse guards and talking to the uh, to the, to the people in Hackney who are responsible for this site to see whether that might, uh, that might come to something. Um, on the southern fringe of Cambridge again, we started to look at how you would build suburban, a whole new suburban extension. Um, it's too far out to be called urban, um, but how it might be deeply sustainable, and that's to do with not only a sort of site level strategies to do with orientation and stuff, but, but actually what the nature of streets and spaces between. So we weren't talking about, we weren't building designing buildings, we were designing the streets and the, uh, the social um, and landscape infrastructure. And this work persuaded the City Council to adopt it as a strategy. So they're now developing this with another architect um, as, as a housing. And, uh, and, um, but they did, they did then say to us, well, how do you deal with the community development in something in a, in a new edge of town settlement? So, Coming at it from the other angle, in terms of Section 106 receipts, we developed a rather complicated plan for how you release money from, from housing development to create funding for a community strategy, and how you then dealt with the co-location of all of those elements like pharmacy and doctors and libraries and police stations and um, community centres and sports provision how you co-located those to make most efficient use of them, and preferably in a way that that stuff was there before any houses got built. So we worked at all this, and um, we'll come on to the outcome of that in a minute. But we've also done quite a lot of work with um, Transport for London and the um, GLA on um, the, kind of the implications of major infrastructure development, and, and how you plan for those, and how you plan for them and control what happens out of that. So this is a document we produced two years ago called Crossrail Atlas. And we basically, uh, it was largely desk-based research, but we explored the deprivation of inequality conditions of all of the, around all of the uh, proposed Crossrail stations. And then also looked with, we're talking to the um, estate agents on uh, what the market opportunities were, what the site conditions of each of these stations were in order to help the GLA work out where they put their limited um, regeneration funding in that, that rides along with Crossrail to help, hopefully, the more deprived areas. I mean, interestingly, since, um, since Ken Livingston left and Boris arrived, the, the priorities of have no have undoubtedly shifted. And uh, rather, than, rather than funding being aimed at the, the most impoverished areas, they're now being aimed at areas that are more likely to vote Conservative or more likely to vote Boris. So there's been a subtle political shift, but it was a fantastic piece of work. Uh, and the, another strand of our research has been into 
kind of conditions for future work, and this is a study we did for CUP of their printing workshop, and how, how you might take an existing building that's nearly an acre and, and work in it. So starting from St. Jerome in a cell through to the kind of organisational structure of, a, of an international publishing agency to develop uh, proposals for buildings in buildings and how you might modulate the environment of those with the environment of the, uh, the enclosure of the existing fabric. Um, that has led to the design of the Future Business Centre which has been completed and just won an award on the North of <coughs> Cambridge. We did all the design work, someone else has built it and they got the award. But um, this was again a kind of exercise in, in what the conditions of work might be and how you design spaces that are that are robust and adaptable and open to change. So in a way looking at the um, looking at building unfinished buildings that, that they can they can um, they can mutate and change over their lives. The the problem with that message is it's not terribly attractive to developers. They like the idea of finite um, and they like the idea of control. They like the idea that you something is fixed and it's finished and there's nothing negotiable about it and they can then set up a letting agency or a management committee to run it and people can't just change the doors or screw things to the walls without getting formal consent. Um, and the final strand of interest which is something that I've been working on particularly is, is the approach to sustainability and on the one hand, there are lots of people doing work with amazing sustainable new buildings, uh, but one's aware, and this Michael Kelly quote um, reinforces it, that most of the buildings we're going to be living in by 2050 already exist, and the, the big imperative is to, is to deal with their energy use and carbon emissions. And if you're, if you're building uh, a, a, a sustainable new town on a greenfield site, that's relatively easy. If you're trying to tackle the, um, if you're trying to tackle the, the uh, energy efficiency of somewhere like the centre of Sheffield, you know, with very complex uh, building and land ownership patterns, and uh, enormously difficult, to, uh, to, it's enormously difficult to motivate people actually to do it. So we we decided that the the, the the interesting territory was in retrofit and finding the right kind of clients and finding the right kind of scale. That kind of um, scale of the difficultly possible was where the greatest gains were to be made, rather than the, the impossible, really, uh, dense urban centres and trying to tackle centres of central London. Well, it might be possible with the great estates, but very difficult to get them motivated. Uh, where and, 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 and uh, avoiding the easy was actually. Um, yeah, there are there are housing development developers. A lot of people like Field and Clegg Bradley are already doing that pretty 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 well. So we started to tackle refurbishment of existing buildings. This is a 60s building in, in Cambridge. This is a 60s building on the edge of Cambridge. This is graduate housing. And we were looking always to um, to halve the energy use, to double the efficiency of the equipment that supplied that. You know, that, that, that ventilated, lit, and, um, and heated the, the equipment, and then to half the carbon in the supplier. We, we did pretty well with these two projects, um, and we then realised that uh, we were coming up against um, we were coming up against heritage uh, with this, with existing buildings. Some of both of those two were listed, and we started to analyse English heritage, and we realised that they're a pretty they're a pretty dysfunctional, silo-based organisation. And there are people in head office who, who kind of get the point and they understand the science and they are very keen on seeing uh, historic buildings uh, evolve and change and become more sustainable. There are historic building inspectors on the site in the provinces who just think it's all really lovely and it should be kept as it is, no change at all. Uh, so that's led to uh, a piece of work I've been doing, which is research into the government's uh, the Department of Environment, Department of um, Culture, Media and Sport, and DCLG, um, what their policies are about sustainability and what their policies are about heritage. And I'm publishing a paper, which you should read next month, which, which unpicks that. And actually, I think there is a way forward. Uh, and out of this, came a project that we're now on site with, which is a great one listed building in, Cam in Middle Cambridge, Trinity College. Uh, that's the front, 
and that's the back. And um, we are knocking 88% out of its carbon emissions, and we've got listed building consent, it's a great, it's a great one, listed building. Uh, we're making a 60% reduction in the thermal performance. We're only increasing the efficiency uh, by, uh, by, less, by less than 50%. And then we're, we're, we're reducing the carbon in the supply by another half. So we get down to 12% of its current emissions. And that's been a bit of a landmark and it's been a hell of a battle. But it's, um, now it's on site, it's slightly less interesting. They, they're kind of getting it to site or getting it through, through, through planning was the kind of interesting bit as far as I was concerned because that's the bit that's about research and um, discovering new ways of doing things and bringing English Heritage and Department of Energy and Climate Change together and working out how you marry these apparently unresolvable differences. Um, as an illustration to Trinity of how else they might save that amount of carbon, this is uh, an image of their entire central city estate except to short rotation coppice willow. Um, the alternative was to set up a fracking rig in, in Red Court. Um, it wasn't going to do much for the carbon emissions, but it was going to save them an awful lot. And weirdly, the um, <laughs> But the BDP report on the viability of fracking in the UK identifies Cambridge as a, as a hotspot. I suspect it won't happen, but um, <laughs> it was prescient, this image, uh, a year ago. Um, through that, you became very interested in how moisture behaves in buildings, and you realise that actually insulated buildings is a piece of cake. What's really difficult is controlling the comfort and the nature of the environment within buildings once you've insulated them, and actually, that's much more difficult and much, has a much more profound effect on comfort, performance, uh, disease. So that's a, this is an illustration of the, the monitored moisture levels in the interface between the masonry walls and the insulation in New Court. And when the insulation is applied to wet plaster, it's got a, there's a massive moisture peak there. But over six months, it drops down to where it ought to be and it's much steadier and much calmer. The comfort conditions in the room in, that this is monitored have improved enormously. There is much less moisture in the air. The timber, the timber um, insulation we're using actually does some CO2 buffering, uh, but it, it's um, yeah, the comfort conditions have moved from being something that's pretty uncomfortable. People wanted the windows open in order to avoid stuffiness and VACs and things. Now, I'm perfectly happy with an MBHR system running very quietly in the background and uh, better comfort, better, better thermal performance. Um, but became interested in the whole business of moisture and health, and you suddenly discover that the 50-year asthma trends in the UK, which is from about when central heating gets introduced into housing. I mean, before central heating, you have open fires, you have lots of drafts, and actually it's a lot of ventilation. The moisture's kind of dealt with. As soon as you have central heating, you seal the buildings up, stop the drafts because they're uncomfortable, and um, you find a massive spikes in, the, in, in, in the asthma. So if you look at from 50 to, to 80, this is the um, this is the increase in, in the incidence of eczema, asthma, and allergic rhinitis. And I think that's all related to, to the air quality and the moisture of air quality from buildings that are being insulated and um, have been sealed, made, made airtight, but aren't being. And uh, UK is in a UK is in a pretty, a pretty bad place in terms of a map of, of Europe. There's a lot of work going on in the Danish Technical University on this, and it's fantastic. They found that if you uh, if you properly ventilate the moisture out of the classroom, your children perform up to 30% better. I don't know how they measure the performance. If you if you uh, properly ventilate an office building, you get 10% pro more productivity out of your staff. Um, in terms of absenteeism, uh, work completion, illness, and whatever. And, and that's a much bigger number than the kind of money anyone's ever going to save through energy performance. Uh, these are some work done by the BRE on, on what happens when you open up a building that's been insulated 10 years later. And uh, it looks probably not unlike student bathrooms in Sheffield. <laughs> But this is this is this is this is this is all mold, and this is stuff that's getting as long as causing the kind of allergies. And, uh, so this is something we're interested in at the moment. The Swedes are miles ahead of us. They have a wonderfully named <laughs> <laughs> institute institute of moisture, and they decided that control of moisture is more important than the control of heat. 
They're, they're putting more effort into in building rates terms and, uh, and building concept. They're putting more effort into making sure that people are controlling moisture in their buildings properly than they are worried about heat. Because ultimately, moisture has a greater impact on, on users' comfort and health. So um, that's for studio. Um, I was told that the theme of all these lectures is resilience, so I thought I would explore our work in terms of how we understand that. And at one level, and the most obvious level, we're all concerned with climate change and, and in designing buildings that, um, that both mitigate the effects of climate change and are adaptable um, for future climate conditions. So we spend an awful lot of time looking, I don't know whether you guys see this stuff, um, it's the UK SIP projections for 2050. Um, you, can download, you can download it free off the web. It, it's based on probabilistic data, so you can say, well, are you, you can either be optimistic and say emissions are going to fall, or you can be pessimistic and say they're not going to change from the current levels. And this tells you the kind of things that are going to happen to you, some other winter temperatures, rainfall patterns and so on. And, and we should all be designing on the basis of this data and the worst conditions are in each case. Um, we take a view that the uh, eco rococo is, is, is not the way to go. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we believe that, our, that all the roads should really be sustainable in the same way as they stand up and keep the rain out. And so we're, we're not fans of the, um, the kind of trophy, trophy technologies or um, token gestures to um, environmental sustainability. Uh, as I said before, we're interested in the, in the, if you look at a city, you know, there's, there's people working on UK towns, um, not so much under this new coalition government, under the coalition government, but under Labour, it certainly were. It's almost impossible to, to actually um, retrofit the dense cores of cities in, in, a, in a way that's sustainable. It's, very, it's almost impossible to negotiate how to do heat networks or local energy networks. In any, in any affordable way, and we've been working on it in Cambridge and, and actually given up. The, the university and the city have now given up. <coughs> we think in this middle territory, kind of urban infill, is where the big rewards lie. And we've done two schemes one in Bow for uh, 60 apartments uh, opposite the match factory in, in Bow, which were um, passive house standard um, fabric and um, had lots of, uh, lots of allotments on the roof. And then this in St. Ives, which is going to be built now, and this is just seven, seven houses, seven, seven family houses, but there's as much space given over to productive landscape as there is, as there is to houses and private gardens. And the second way in which we understand um, resilience is in terms of robustness and durability. And, um, and long-term adaptation. And, and we find that we're increasingly asked by clients who know exactly what they want, and they know exactly what they want the day they brief you. Most clients, when you point out to them that what they need to know is what they're going to want in three years' time when the building's finished, are slightly affronted. And the idea that what they want might then change and, and the building should be designed to, to adapt to not only what they don't know they want now, but what they don't know what they, what they want in the future. This is. Uh, so this, is, uh, so this was a hostel for um, disabled students in Cambridge. So the disabled students occupied the ground floor. The floor above was for uh, key workers. And we designed it to accommodate disabled students on the ground floor, but knowing that the Dis Disability um, Discrimination Act was coming in, we designed it to be converted into a university health centre. And the therapy pools that were part of the disabled hostel would become part of the therapy that the university medical centre would offer. And um, people could see why you were doing it, but they weren't necessarily sure they wanted to pay for it. Uh, and, and so it's a difficult line to tread, but it's something that has to be gone through. This was a competition we did recently for an Oxford College, where they thought the problem was that they needed a new porter's lodge at the top of these stairs. And actually, when you look at it, you realise the problem is that they need, they need a new entrance, completely new entrance that's on the level of the street, and they need, they've got a whole categories of people arriving at the college who didn't exist when Hawksmoor designed it. And uh, actually, they need to rethink the whole strategy of entrance. So yeah, and we didn't win because we didn't answer the right question, but um, we are now working with them on actually 
helping them ask the right questions so the right answer can be come up with. In the meanwhile, someone else has won a project to design a little shed <laughs> at the top of the stairs. Um, so I think that um, we place enormous importance on working out what the real question ought to be when clients come to us, either with briefs or competitions. And very often it's not what they think it is. And we're not as successful as others in, 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 in persuading them that, that you know, you've asked us to do this, but actually you've got it wrong. And I think that um, it's important for their long term. I mean, quite often they realize a year or so down the line that they got it wrong, but by then they're working with someone else. But I think that resi resilience has a lot to do with designing beyond the brief and designing to accommodate stuff that the client doesn't know they don't know and stuff that they have no idea they don't know and won't know for another 10 years. And we found that, in a way, our, the, the clients that, that, that keep coming back to us, um, the clients that keep coming back to us are, are clients with a really long-term interest in their estate. So it's actually Cambridge Colleges and it's people like the GLA and the London boroughs who have vast housing stock or big um, park and, and recreation facilities that they, they, they need to reinvent. In terms of building fabric, we we like our build, we, we try to design our buildings to be to be deliberately unfinished and, and negotiable and uh, adaptable. So this is the this is the inside of the creative exchange. It's bare concrete. Anything that's not bare concrete is actually just a Douglas fir ply. The intention is that occupants will change it and and they'll carpet it and then someone else coming to carpet up. Other people will build walls they'll come down. The whole, the whole thing is negotiable as a set of interiors. Uh, student housing, again, this is all just made out of cross-section <coughs> timber. This is when it was opened, but actually some of the walls have been plastered, other people have covered them with posters. The whole thing is a, it's an armature for, for a habitation rather than a kind of finished piece. Uh, this, is, uh, this is about the architecture of defence, really. This is the community centre in in Trumpington, and the previous two iterations of Human Sensor were both burnt to the ground and, and heavily vandalised and destroyed. So we worked with the we worked with the local youth on how to do on, on what they thought a cool version of a defensible building would be. And so this thing is covered with steel mesh, behind which is polycarbonate painted polycarbonate um, sheeting. And and so this is this is a project for the um, again it's the view of the park a kind of client that keeps returning to us. This is Trinity. This was actually a project that didn't involve any buildings. We talked about how to manage maintenance of the college and how you deal with how you deal with that efficiently and, and strategically. Um, the next level of resilience that we embody in our trying to embody in our work is that to do with the kind of public client team buy-in and consultation and um, collaboration. We spend a lot of time designing and constructing tools for collaboration and consultation because actually just sticking some pictures up on the wall isn't really going to do it. You're not necessarily going to engage it. Public are pretty cynical about, about consultation and they've generally been offered too much before but we've designed a series of, of structures that engage people in how they use energy, how they use their buildings how they're going to use their, their new recreation space and kind of draw it in a way that's engaging for, for those communities. But ultimately, um, ultimately, any amount of collaboration and consultation will not lead you through design, um, however unfortunate that is. Um, lots of people believe that it will. And those are, those are only mechanisms for testing, sometimes to destruction, for testing the best designs. So there's a, there's a level of resilience involved in the design process in the generation of designs that are resilient to that kind of testing, that can absorb that consultation feedback, can absorb that collaboration, but still make sense, it's still be kind of rooted in the brief, still be rooted in the site. And that kind of resilience is one of the hardest to maintain because we're constantly under attack for being opinionated um, architects who've already decided what we want to do and, um, and, uh, and inflexible. But actually, the, the, the strength of, that, of, 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 a, of, of a good design will be resilient to all that stuff and be able to take it on board. Uh, we designed 
will fail. Um, and I think the final, the final aspect of adaptation, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, is, is, is to do with relevance and to do with um, to do with the everyday. So this is an exhibition we did in um, the Arctic Foundation about 10 years ago now, uh, which was dealing with explorations of the everyday. Uh, this is a beautiful piece of work by Helen Stratford, who I think is still involved up here, uh, exploring the, the kind of folklore and um, the kind of local mythology to do with a certain place in Cambridge, Christ Pieces, which happened to be where Milton wrote um, Paradise Lost, Milton's kind of famous regicide, wrote Paradise Lost sitting underneath a, a um, mulberry tree, which was part of a plantation that was planted across that whole, that whole um, square. Um, Oliver Cromwell built a defensive wall across it called um, Pike's Walk, still, I mean, it was not taken away until uh, to the end of the Victorian era. And now we've got Princess Di's um, memorial. So there's a kind of history of this place to do with to do with regicides, to do with royalty, to do with, to do with death. Um, and uh, this is a piece that Helen put together about turning that into a dress. But this is a building in the fraternity and it's about connecting the space of, of a historic bit of garden to the Garden of Eden back into the, in the building and through this slightly weird black glass soffit which actually reflects the kind of garden interior into the social spaces of the building. And at Manby Green, when we dug down to build the foundations of this pavilion, we found that it had been the site of the London projectile <coughs> and there were 12 foot of black ash. And we managed to get planners to accept that we could change the way this thing was built. And we used the black brick and the, um, and the kind of fragmented bond of brick above, above head height to actually try and recall, to, to, to embody that, that kind of history and that uh, that spoil site um, within the park. Um, cultural relevance. Um, over the last two millennia, we've drifted from uh, belief in magic. Uh, this is a fantastic book. If you haven't read it, probably not time now to read it a bit earlier, but it's a great, really great book. Yeah, drifted from a belief in magic and animism into, into religion. Um, from the Enlightenment, there's a kind of uh, popular tradition, popular thought that we, um, in Lightman Thomas, we kind of drifted into a belief in science and that secularism went, went hand in hand with, a, with a, um, an understanding of science. I think that's entirely misplaced. What we actually have is, is, a, is a kind of techno-theism. We, we don't really believe in what science tells us we ought to do. I mean, if we did, we'd all be retrofitting our existing buildings and we'd all be conserving energy and we wouldn't be driving anywhere. We'd be living like New York. I mean, we'd be living with that kind of sustainable density. Clearly not, no one can be fagged. We believe that we, we have a kind of almost childlike belief that somehow technology is going to save us. Um, and, and in a way, that's more like the superstitious belief in magic than it is in um, a, a rational belief in either religion or, or, um, or science. So whether it's statins or, or parametrics or, or BIM or, or fracking or even the RIBA uh, plan of work, I think there's a, there's a, there's a very strong sense that, that we've been offered technologies or procedures uh, which will somehow guarantee design quality or, or professional standards. And actually, I think they're all somewhat of a delusion and um, an only uh, really good design and careful thought and insight and collaboration and resilient design are actually going to deliver us um, from the kind of problems that face us. And I think Goya saw this a long time ago. This image is called um, Foolish Precision. And I think it should sit inside the manual to any BIM or parametrics um, guidebook or handbook. Um, he also produced this image, which is called the, uh, the Sleep of Reason Produces Monsters. It's not entirely clear, or the Dream of Reason Produces Monsters. It's not entirely clear whether he meant that, when, that, that, that reason aspires to a state which produces monsters, or that when reason is lapsed, monsters are what's produced. There's an ambiguity there, but either, I think, uh, relates to um, what happens when architects uh, either 
um, aspire to be super re rational, and you end up with parametrics and stuff, or 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 actually um, or actually switch off their reason. I think reason is is a kind of critical factor in any part of the design process. That's what enables you to collaborate. That's what enables you to be, to, to make compromises, contingent decisions that actually embrace the rest of culture within your activity. And I uh, got it, but it's spot on. Um, and now I'm going to talk. And uh, what is the time? Ten to seven. Ten to seven. Okay. Okay. I was now going to talk about um, the other cultural reference that I think, with the loss of that structure of of, of cultural understanding of space from Catholic to the celestial, we've kind of lost the celestial because we don't have God and technology as it fill the gap. But the Catholic in the sense, and, and the ground are, are, are still really with us. I think, um, to go back to, to this image of Helen's, I think that, that the ground understood as territory and, and a full understanding of the, the uh, cultural, historic, folkloric context of our actions is absolutely critical to the relevance of our work. Um, I think the ground, as understood as some sense of the kind of primitive and chronic, is, is, is the other angle on that. And, and I've got a number of, of slides of, of people whose work over the last 114 years, um, I think, kind of begin to touch on it. But the other thing that characterizes them is Quite often this works unfinished and negotiable and all of those other things that I think offers it. So this is um, this is stationed in Pennsylvania by um, uh, Furness. This is an amazing apartment block in Milan by an architect called and, uh, Andreani. Um, this is a house we lived in for a while in Cambridge. It's called Spring House, Corfe House. It's by Sandy Wilson. The concept, because in those days you had to have a very strong diagrammatic context, concept was uh, living in a grotto looking out through a forest and the back wall of this thing is, is, is a three-story unperforated masonry wall with a fireplace in the corner and this is looking out through the columns um, to, to the garden but fantastic space that really made one feel you were in touch with the ground you were in touch with the with the earth and that setting against which to look at the landscape um, Jim Sterling I think had it in his best moments Alvaro Caesar, the pools at Porto, fantastic project. Uh, as are the pools in Baal by um, Zumtor. I mean, these are all, uh, I, I'm sure to show one, we could do a 35 minute talk about any of these, but I just want to give you a, a series of snapshots. Uh, Eduardo Sudinamura, this is a series of kind of sports annexes to a house um, in Porto. Again, just the modulation of the ground and the way that um, the depth and the, and the foundation of the building and its setting and revealed is, is astonishing. Um, the Danes in their, in their wilder moments, this is Jackson, the bank in Copenhagen, really begin to express some, some deep kind of rooting. Uh, Morphosis, this is the um, Cape Mandini, um restaurant actually in, in LA. I can't find any pictures of the existing that come anywhere near this model. Um, the office, that's Piers and Von Saverin. This is a Guggenhardt Villa, it's in Brussels. The interior is, is kind of wonderfully warm, uh, but completely unfinished, completely kind of adaptable, inhabitable, modifiable. Uh, and then um, Artigas, Lacaton of Versailles, I think, are, are doing some amazing work. I mean, again, the kind of the lightness of this stuff, it's not, it, it doesn't speak of the chronic, but it actually really brings in um, the sense to which this is just a kind of temporary state, that like, the entire house is built in a way that is, um, is negotiable by current future occupants. And um, something we saw last week in, in, in New York, the Stephen Hall forefront for art and architecture, a tiny project, but absolutely fantastic. And then uh, also New York, this is the Earth Room. I mean, in New York, you need, you need Central Park, you need Coney Island as uh, kind of escape valves from that kind of density and, uh, 
But in the middle of uh, in the middle of Soho is this astonishing piece by Walter de Maria, which is just an apartment filled with soil, and it's wet, and it's uh, you can smell it. It's weedy and, and cleared of uh, mould and algae growth and whatever, but it's so it's immaculate, pristine, but wet, kind of fecund soil. And it's an astonishing piece to find in the, in the middle of um, bustling Manhattan. Uh, at the other end of the scale, there's people like James Turrell are reminding us of, of, of light and the sky. This is, uh, this is another piece of it in the States. But, um, but going back underground, uh, the Sarah talk to mixes, I and mean, then you've never felt more underground than you do. However many stories above ground you are in, you know, it's, you know, it's astonishing you know, steel spaces. And then in the realm of kind of um, negotiable making, unmaking. Um, I think the work of um, Matt Clark. This is that, this is the house, which he took photographs shortly before it was destroyed, but where he makes an incision all the way through the house. This stuff's really worth looking at. And uh, then in the sense of uh, interiors, the Kurt Schwitter's Mertz, series of Mertz installations and paintings, collages. Um, that's, that's just a hut. That he, that, he, uh, that he he built, he collaged, uh, and that's painting Jim Dine's work. Um, again, normally you say it in slightly fluffy parts and stuff, but actually he did this whole series of paintings of, of tools that actually kind of speak more to the, the kind of art, of the, the, the experience of kind of holding stuff, digging and, 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 and building than the, the, the most artists. And then uh, finally, my my favourite is Joe Giacometti. There's a kind of restless, um, unfinished quality to, to this stuff that um, that one would like to be able to capture and embody in, in work. I think it's very difficult in architecture to to produce buildings that have these kinds of um, these kind of qualities, this kind of agitation. Uh, it's very difficult to operate as a as a practice, you know, professional identity insurance and all of that other stuff <coughs> in that kind of way. But I think it's where one wants to, one wants to be and where we aspire to be. Um, where we go to from from now is uncertain. But our current policy, cultural and professional context is against genuineness. It's against people who are trying to do unfinished work or operate on boundaries between research and strategy. And, um, and buildings. Uh, there's a kind of simultaneously a, a um, suspicion of experts and a belief in the in the hoi polloi or in the uh, belief in the laity as, as, as being people who as being the people who can derive briefs, produce designs. There's an overconfidence in the in the in the capacity of consultation to deliver uh, good architecture. Um, and it's uh, difficult to, to maintain the stance that we do. It's, it's a very feedback, competitive world. It's very difficult to, to act as a salesman for the kind of work that we want to do. Um, especially if it's not very easy to define quite what that is. So as a practice, we are, we are trying to be resilient. We are trying to work out where we next go, or how we next change. What kind of clients do we need to work with? What kind of pictures do we need to find? Or do we just become we just become a school of architecture, and we sort of submerge ourselves within, a, within an existing school and, and um, try and find a future in there. So um, we're at the moment of, of uh, adaptation and change ourselves, and so the, kind of the notion of resilience is actually struck a chord. But preparing these slides. So that's, uh, that's it. interesting to see um, a practice go beyond buildings and dwell into research and actually ask questions and not just sort of solve problems. Very interesting. Um, so have any questions? Yeah. So I want to know that uh, I'm from the studio named uh, Facility Resilience in the University, but I'm very confused about the, the definition of resilience. Uh, so I want to ask a question about how can you define a, a project, whether it is qualified as a 
as a, I mean, aspect of the resilience. How can you define whether it's good or not in the aspect of resilience? Well, uh, if someone comes to us with a project, or, or if we're, how, how, do we, how do we review a project? Yes. I, mean, I mean, you should never do anything for one reason. I mean, you should never just design a building. I mean, you should always, every, every, everything you do should have at least three, that's our rule, three aims. And, 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 and they should always be about advancing your understanding. And about t and, and when someone comes to you with a brief, you, should, you have to, the first thing you have to do is test the brief. You should never take it as a, as a fait accompli that this is, this is what the brief is. So you're given a brief in your design studios. You have to kind of work beyond that and work out, well, what else might this be? Or, or what might be behind it or beyond it? And so resilience isn't something you switch on or switch off. It's actually that kind of how a building, how, how the brief might be adapted, how the building might be adapted, how the inhabitation might be adapted how the design process might be adapted. Yeah, I think are all part of what I would see as being resilient. I don't think it's a... Because our tutor always tells me you, you should work with a community network. If your program doesn't include that aspect, then they won't belong to the resilience. So it's quite weird, I don't know. Well, I, I, think, I think consultation it, it, and, 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 and establishing a kind of communal re relevance of your project is an important aspect. But it's not going to produce a design for you. I mean, you have to have something which you test through that process. And if your if your design is resilient, you know, if it's good enough to withstand that kind of um, testing, you, know, you can say that it's resilient. Like, I mean, sustainable or adaptive, adaptive program. I think all of those things. I mean, I think resilience means lots. Of has lots of meanings, but environmental sustainability, adaptability, robustness, relevance, cultural, specific local relevance and broader cultural relevance are all characteristics of using it. So it's not a good answer to it. <laughs> Given your closing comments about um, the generalist, what do you think there is in architecture at the moment to be optimistic about? Uh, human spirit. <coughs> no, I, I mean, I think that um, it's difficult to be very optimistic because we, we are simultaneously moving into a world where specialists um, are, are, are very highly regarded, but on the, on the other hand, that there's this kind of, there's this faith in the laity as being as, as, as the somehow food through, um, through the public, you know, you can find good design, and it just doesn't, it doesn't work. And uh, I think the other thing that's, that, that's difficult to be optimistic about is how to make a living. <coughs> um, the fee, fee levels are plummeting, the competition is extraordinarily fierce. And I think, I think that the thing to be optimistic about is if you know yourself and you know your work, is then identifying where you're, what kind of clients you might have, who, who is interested in what you're interested in. And then you go and find, go and find those people. I mean, uh, there, are, there are firms offer, operating, for, there are practices operating very successfully in quite kind of constrained niches and, and, and hopefully happen. But I think, I think self-knowledge is, is a big piece of it. I think it's, um, it's a difficult climate, culturally and economically. So I, I, mean, I, I call that for generalism, because if you can't get a building commission, someone will, <coughs> someone will uh, take on your master plan and uh, uh, will pay you for some research or, or to teach. Yeah, I'm quite interested to know um, how much of your work is done speculatively and then how much of that has actually turned into maybe a contract or... We spend... Um, we spend 40% of our time on speculative and prospective work. That's two days a week. And I would say that about 10% of that actually becomes stuff that gets paid for. So it's difficult to, to, to then equate that into money because some of these become quite big projects and pay quite well. But, yeah. but it's, I think um, we could. We, we could do better financially if we spent 100% of our time designing projects, but we would um, we'd probably go mad. 
So I think 40% of your time speculating and, and, and prospectively putting together projects and then going out and finding, finding that client or patron or local authority where they might, might have opted this. So that's what we do. Yeah. Um, just, I was wondering, um, you can do a lot of speculative and mass planning kind of stuff, but what, um, when in, in your previous uh, companies and things, how, where you worked before, did that, did that kind of exist, or was it mainly just buildings, or was is it is this something you can well, ask it to you? Well, when I was at Jim Sterling's, we just did buildings, and, um, and we did Jim's buildings, um, that's frustrating. Um, uh, at McCormack's, we did some master planning, but it was of the kind where you have a master plan and that's it, and that lays out the plan. And anyone who wants to digress from that or, or do something different, and any part of it, if that's a sin, and you can't, you can't be tolerated, and you throw a hissy fit and stomp off. So, uh, no, nothing existed like the plan of master planning we tried to do, which is, which is basically establishing a very loose framework that has some cultural relevance and is it's kind of rooted in the specificity of the site, but then allows for any number of things to happen and, and can, can adapt and, and mutate as, as change occurs. That's the context or condition evolve. Um, so that kind of loose plan, even strategic plan, we call it rather master plan. It's much more evolutionary than, than fixed. Okay, great, but thank you. Thank you very much.